Hello and welcome to this my review of the Ducky 1-2 Horizon mechanical keyboard and drop MT3 Dasher keycaps. Wait a minute, this is... Okay, to clear up any confusion, I've been watching this channel a fair bit recently and one thing I found irresistibly appealing, apart from of course the fantastic content and presentation in general, is old keyboards with lovely spherical keycaps with dish tops in colours that aren't beige, grey, white or black. I spend a lot of time at the keyboard of my computer, editing videos, typing scripts, corresponding with scammers and the like, so it's worth my while thinking about making that keyboard experience a slightly better and more pleasurable one. I decided what I really want is a comfortable mechanical keyboard with some lovely old-fashioned keycaps. Finding a solution to this was harder than I anticipated, and as usual, my criteria were to blame. Firstly, I wanted a UK ISO keyboard. That is, a keyboard with things like this. The pound currency symbol is on the 3 key. That's UK layout. And with an enter or return key that's this sort of shape. That's what makes it ISO. Now, I know a lot of people, especially mechanical keyboard enthusiasts, don't like or approve of numpads. You do you, but I use mine quite a lot. I've used a full-size keyboard all my working life, and for bashing in pure numbers, I find it a lot quicker and more comfortable than using the number row. Nearly everything in DaVinci Resolve is a number, and making fine adjustments by number is far more precise than trying to use the mouse controls. So right, full-size ISO UK mechanical keyboard. Simple, right? Those criteria immediately eliminate nearly all of the mechanical keyboards on the market, most of which are ANSI format, with an enter key that looks like this, or are 60% size or something other than full size. Next, keycaps, and of course I could just use the keycaps that are supplied with whatever keyboard I buy, but I wanted something a bit special. Again, most keycap sets cater to ANSI keyboards, or less than full size layouts. In fact, I started to think I would simply never find anything suitable. Then I stumbled across this. It's the MT3 Dasher keycap set from Drop. It's inspired by one of the very first computer keyboards, the Data Dasher Terminal from the late 1970s, a time in history when people were not afraid to fill their lives with colourful things. The MT3 keycap design comes from Matt 3 who seems to be an all-round good guy and has actually made all of the design files for these keycaps public so people can 3D print their own if they want. Now, the keycap set on sale from Drop, these are fairly good quality keycaps, thick plastic, they are ABS, PBT would have been nicer, but they are double shot, which means the keycap legends go right through the plastic like the words in a stick of seaside rock. But even so, $110 for a few handfuls of plastic still seems a bit steep to me. I know it's not just about the raw plastic materials, it's about distribution and manufacture and tooling and warehousing and so on, but even so, $110 for keycaps is kind of pushing it for me. However, with a little patience on my side, I waited and waited, and eventually a set came up in an online marketplace that was new and less than half price. Perhaps someone had bought them in error, or just didn't like them or something. I bought the keycaps. I'm not going to say how much or where, because that would just help people to stalk me. Now, having ordered the keycaps, I had to find a keyboard to put them on. I considered some of the compact full-size layouts, like the Keychron K4 or the Vortex Vibe, but those typically rearrange some of the keys into different rows, and this would be a problem for my Dasher keycaps, because each row of keys is sculpted differently for ergonomics of typing. So you can't just take a key off one row and plonk it on another row. It wouldn't align properly with the height or angle of the other keycaps on the same row, which meant I would have to find a normal layout, full-size UK keyboard. There are only a few choices. GMMK has one. Ducky has one, Philco has one. There are a few kind of cheap off-brand ones too, but these typically have clicky blue switches, which I don't really like. GMMK would have been a good choice, as the keyboard is hot swappable. The switches can be replaced or swapped out without any soldering, but I don't like the open frame style of that keyboard, where you can see the tops of the actual switches. So I decided to go for the Ducky 1-2 Horizon. In part because of the colour, the deep blue front fascia of this keyboard echoes the blue top of the original Data Dasher terminal, so it sort of fits. Again, this is not a cheap item, although I find the prices for an actual keyboard with electronics and switches and such to be a little more easily swallowed than the keycaps. Still, patience and time, and eventually one came up at a bargain price and I bought it. This keyboard has no flashy LED backlighting, but that suits me just fine. And so, here we are. It does seem very odd to be pulling off and replacing the brand new keycaps of a keyboard I haven't yet used in earnest, but these double shot ducky keycaps won't go to waste. I'll resell them or donate them somewhere that they will be appreciated. And yes, Cherry MX Red. 
I actually would have preferred a little bit of tactility. The Gatoron Browns in my macro pad are actually very nice. However, this keyboard is not hot swap and only comes with cherry switches in various colours. Cherry MX Brown is, I understand, quite a lot more scratchy than Gatoron Brown, and I don't like clicky blue switches, so I chose red as the kind of least evil option on the menu. If, after a period of use, I really hate these too much, I might even consider getting the soldering iron out and replacing all of the switches in this keyboard, but we'll just see. And on go the keycaps, and they really look superb. But there's one more problem. The Ducky keyboard has four extra keys that are not part of the standard ISO layout. These extra keys launch the calculator and controller system audio. The MT3 keycap set contains quite a few spares and blank keycaps, but you can't just use any key. These extra four keys are on row zero and need keycaps sculpted for row zero. There are none of these spare in the pack. So the obvious thing to do here is try and make some of my own. I used a two-part silicone to make a mold based on the escape keycap. First I stuck it down to a flat surface and also stuck down a few metal nuts. These will create registration bumps. I made a dam around the keycap with a cut off piece of plastic yoghurt pot. Then I mixed up my silicone and poured it in, trying not to introduce any bubbles. Once that had cured I removed the silicone block from the casing, trimmed off a little bit of flash and removed the metal nuts. So the second part of the mould will mate with these and it will fit together neatly and hopefully consistently. I pack the inside of the keycap with white tack, just so the keycaps I eventually make will be a bit more solid and forgiving of minor imperfections like bubbles. I stuck in some pieces of cocktail sticks. These will create filling and vent channels for the resin casting process later. I covered all of the exposed silicone surface with Vaseline. If I don't do this, the second pour of silicone will just bond to the existing material quite completely. The first half of the mould goes into an identical yoghurt pot, then I mixed up my silicone and poured it in. On curing, the top half of the mould can be carefully pulled away from the bottom. Out comes the original keycap and pieces of stick, and now we're ready to cast resin into this mould. I mixed up some low viscosity epoxy. I don't have any degassing facility, so I'll need to be careful not to make too many bubbles. I want my keycaps to be fully opaque, so I ordered some titanium dioxide powder. There is nothing quite like the worry of receiving a bag of white powder in the post. This stuff's really finely divided, and I hoped it would just make the base resin white, like milk. I also added some alcohol-based dye to give it a tint. I then poured a bit of resin into both halves of the mould to properly wet the corners and difficult areas, then mated the two halves of the mould together, and using a small syringe I injected resin down through the filling hole until I saw it rise up out of the opposite holes. If I've done this right, that should mean the whole of the inside void is now filled. I left the resin to cure overnight, much longer in fact than its prescribed cure time, and I didn't throw away the mixing cup, as this provides witness to the cure state of the resin inside the mould. Pulling the keycap out of the mould requires a little care. I trimmed off the sprues and flash, and here's the end result. It's not good enough. The colour is poor, and there are lots of bubbles. Must try harder. I ordered some different pigment powders, so I wouldn't need any separate dyes. And then heating the resin in a water bath also helps here, because it reduces the viscosity of the resin even further. And I figured out that after mixing the resin and tapping the mix container on a hard surface to expel some of the bubbles, I can sort of degas it a little bit by placing my finger over the end of the syringe and retracting the plunger. This creates a partial vacuum. The bubbles that are in suspension grow bigger, and this allows them to float up to the top more easily. Not perfect, but might be good enough. It is a bit risky though, because you can end up pulling the plunger out or squeezing the syringe too much and resin might go everywhere. I was lucky, actually the word is careful, and nothing bad happened. I also figured that if I cut away some strips in the top part of the mould here, this will give any remaining bubbles somewhere to go that isn't part of the final keycap. Once again, I partly filled the mould, mated the two halves and injected the resin, leaving some extra on top of the sprue holes to drain back down inside. The result this time, very much better, in fact good enough to use. A little bit of trimming and sanding, and here's the final keycap. Repeat for three more, and now I've got these four keys capped in a style which, whilst it doesn't exactly match, is sort of in keeping with the rest of the set. I decided not to add any legends to these keycaps, as it's fairly easy to remember calculator, mute, volume down and up. Casting things out of resin is fun, but it can be sort of wasteful. I tried my best to minimise waste here. Disposable gloves and syringes can be used multiple times. And the leftover resin from each pour I added into a spare cup, together with the cut up pieces of flash and sprue from previous castings. And then once this cup is all set up, I'm hoping it will look a bit like Fordite, and I can pop it out and make something out of it by carving it or turning it on the lathe. I did make one more keycap as an experiment, with a small clear pour first, filled with carefully cut square pieces of the previous resins, followed by an opaque pour. 
I'm still in two minds as to whether to use this one or not. On the one hand, I think the four plain keycaps are more of a consistent set, but on the other hand, the keycap with the resin pieces completes a more consistent and memorable kind of logical set of key appearances. Let me know what you think about that. One thing that did catch me by surprise is the legend of the escape key that I used for my master mold is visible on the finished keycaps. Even though on the master key itself, it feels like it's completely flush. I suppose I could sand this back, but it's barely noticeable except when the light catches it like this. Before anyone asks, I'm not going to be making any of these to sell or give away. I don't make things to sell. It takes up too much of my time and gets in the way of the next projects on my list. So, that was quite a journey, but typing on this keyboard is a lot more pleasant and comfortable than the Logitech G213 I had before. And that matters, because, as I say, I spend a fair bit of my week here. This keyboard sounds and feels nice to use. I'm not in pursuit of such things as the deepest thocks or complete absence of pings and ticks. This is good enough for my current level of enthusiasm about keyboards. And I can also uninstall that Logitech bloatware from my PC, which is nice. I suppose I should talk about a few of the small things I really like, or that are not exactly to my liking. So here they are. For the drop MT3 keycaps, the profile of these keycaps is just sublime. The dished keytops are a joy to the fingers. Compared to flatter keytops, it's like the difference between a comfortable bed and sleeping on the floor. I especially like that the home keys on the main keyboard and the numeric pad are locatable by subtly deeper dishing, with a very slight lip on the front edge. That's a lovely bit of design. Not so good is the manufacturing finish on the skirt. You can still see a little line of moulding flash at the bottom of the key here. It's not a big deal, it doesn't interfere with anything, and it's only noticeable on the rows where the bottom edges of the keys are visible. I might carefully sand it off if it annoys me, but this should have really been finished properly in the factory. The legend on the numpad enter key is nearly too big for the key and it looks kind of awkward. They should have replaced this with a carriage return symbol or something else, although the symbol might have been out of keeping with the rest of the keys because shift and tab are words. But okay, they could have abbreviated this to ENT. Other keys have abbreviated words on them, so they could have done that or they could have written it vertically. And on the ducky keyboard, I like how it's as big as it needs to be for a full-size keyboard, but no bigger. It doesn't waste any space with unnecessary bezels or casing. I like how solidly it sits on the desk. It's heavy, it's rigid, the feet are grippy. It doesn't feel like a separate thing that's just sitting there. It's like typing on a permanent feature of the landscape. What I don't like so much, it has blue LEDs for indicating the caps lock, number lock and scroll lock. And they are those awful, penetrating, eye-curdlingly bright blue LEDs that just hurt to look at. Fortunately, these LEDs are recessed inside a tiny hole, so I can hopefully fill that up with something to mitigate the glare a bit. I might cast some little tinted resin pegs to go in there. It's got a cable channel at the back, which is a nice feature, but the options are only to have the cable exit at the right or left side horizontally, which makes the cable interfere with the mouse, or to leave the cable unrestrained in the middle and at risk of pulling out. I would have added a little gap here and here in the channel edge so that the cable could be also rooted out of the top left or right corners. I might just cut a gap in this piece of plastic myself, actually. So do let me know what you think, and what you might have done differently or better, and what choices you might have made instead of mine. I am particularly interested to know if you agree or disagree on that whole equation of cost versus comfort. Is it worth spending a lot of money on things that you use all day every day or not? What do you think? Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.